Hello everyone, this is Adam Pintar with the Statistics Division of ASQ. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to announce an opportunity for students. The Statistics Division will offer up to five student grants intended to help defray the costs of attending the 2017 Fall Technical Conference in Philadelphia. To find out more and to apply, please visit ASQ.org slash statistics slash about slash FTC dash student. Our speaker today is Scott Benson. Scott holds a Bachelor's of Science in Physics from the University of Wisconsin, River Falls. He also holds a Master's of Science in Statistics with an emphasis in quality improvement and productivity from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Scott is a certified black belt from ASQ and he continues to be an active member of his local ASQ section board. Scott has over 20 years of experience working with a wide range of companies and clients from Fortune 500 organizations to small business. He has a passion for delivering data-driven solutions and helping clients improve business processes. Though much of Scott's experience is in manufacturing, centering on improvement projects, he has taught many statistics classes to clients. Examples include measurement systems analysis, design of experiments, and statistical process control. The title of today's webinar is Process and Performance Capability. All microphones other than the presenters have been muted, so if you have any questions or comments during the webinar, please use the questions interface in the GoToWebinar control panel. Scott will address questions at the end of the presentation. Scott, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Um, I have to decide here if I, uh, can everybody see my screen right now? It should be a nice title page. Uh, and if it isn't, I have to do that yet. There we go. Hopefully everybody sees my screen and I can continue here. Uh, Adam, if you could just give me quick feedback and let me know if it seems to be going all right, I'd appreciate that. Yes, I can see the uh, screen and the pointer, the little oh. red dot. All right, thank you. So let's get going here, everybody. Like uh, Adam, I wanted to thank Adam very much for that very, very nice introduction there. And I also want to thank for the nice round of applause that everybody is giving me right here now at the, at the moment. Um, so if we get started, I would like to say that uh, the objectives here, that what I'm going to be looking at, is giving you a general overview of why, why is there such a thing as process capabilities, indices, what types of indices are there. There's the capability indice and a performance indice. What are some of the key assumptions associated with those indices? The types of actions that you can take from knowledge and understanding of those indices. And uh, practical thoughts that are probably not exam related, related. And overall, I'm going to focus on what, does, what are these indices and how are they relate with respect to the CQE exam. All right, so let's get the wheels rolling here. A general overview and to sit down and say that every process varies in some form or another. Whether we are dealing with widgets, forms, or services, the widget, you're going to be taking something and it's going to have some variation to it. If, when you, somebody is filling out a form in a transactional sense, there's going to be variation associated with that. Whether you're doing certain services, cleaning or detailing services, there's variation associated with all of those. Each of them have some type of an expected outcome, whether the widget is saying I need to understand more about these threads or the diameter of the widget. The form has informational boxes that need to be looked at and filled out correctly. And then if I'm detailing things, I might be worrying about shining or cleaning other things. You know, I got to get some idea about what there is associated with those types of outcomes that I want my process to be dealing with. 
So one thing I'd like to ask people here is to say, can you think of something that has a commonality across all three of these between this one, this one, and this one? What is something common as an outcome somebody might be thinking about across all three, whether it's a widget, a form, or a service? And I would like to suggest a possibility that's common between all of them is something called time. I think each one of those, an outcome someone might be looking at is the time associated with either one of them. Another one might be like an, the number of defects. How many defects does this widget have? How many pieces of information in that form weren't filled out? How many defects associated with detailing a car are there? And if I think that I have things that are associated with any one of those that I need to understand, what is it that we need to do? Well, in order for us to do some analysis and to figure some things out, we need to be thinking about data. I need data in order for things to happen and for me to figure out what's going on. Don't know if many of you have seen the movie Blazing Saddles, but this is my rendition of, of a certain scene in there where, you know, I want to say, data, who needs some stinking data? And here's Edward Deming playing the role of the mayor of the town. But Edward Deming would probably say something more in the lines of saying, that should not say in good, that should say in God we trust and all others require data. Peter Tucker, another person, would say, if you don't measure it, you can't improve it. So my point being is without the data, we're really going nowhere fast. Recently, uh, Wisconsin, and that's where I'm originally located right now, and, and I shouldn't say originally, I am in Wisconsin right now, and that's where I live. Over the weekend, the PGA had the uh, U.S. Open in Wisconsin, and uh, Kopeka won, won it over in a golf course uh, over in eastern Wisconsin. And I'm bringing up the idea of a PGA because I strongly believe in an item called practical, graphical, and analytical. I think that those things are really fundamental in any analysis that somebody takes on. So what do I mean by practical? What do you generally see when you look at the data real quick? Graphical, you kind of say, you know what, there's a lot that a graph can tell and help you understand things in a hurry. Then analytical, what's the math? What is an objective value that can help get us there as we are trying to look at things? <clears throat> So if I move on and say, well, you know what, my process capability has certain things that I need to be concerned about, and I should be concerned about accuracy, I should be concerned about precision, and if I bring those two things together in the idea of a bullseye, and I start thinking about issues that are associated with accuracy and precision, we get this kind of combination of things where I have low accuracy and low precision, but really I want to be at the point of saying high accuracy in high precision, that I am hitting my target as I aim for it. So when it comes to process capabilities, there's one other thing that we should be thinking about, and that is, are there limits to the idea of the outcomes that we're looking for? And a metaphor I'm thinking of is, is can my car fit inside a garage, is what would be important to think about with regards to not only location, but limits. So if I look at my car in my garage right now, I kind of go, geez, it looks like things should be all right. I should be able to park my car in the garage. It actually fits. Now when I look at this particular one, I go, hmm, that doesn't look so good. It appears that my car is going to give me some grief off to the sides here and I'm going to hit some walls and things aren't fitting. If I look at this one now, I say, hmm, I got a good chance about all of that. But oops, when I tried parking it, I plowed it right into the side of the garage. So what is it that we would like to see happen is to say, well, I'd like to make sure I get it in the garage, but this particular one, 
I'm awfully close right here, and I don't know if my passenger can get out. Here, I'm awfully close right here. I don't think the driver can get out. So what we really want to be able to do is to say, I would like it so I have plenty of spaces on each side of it. And this is what we want our processes to do. We want to be able to get it between the walls, kind of centered up. And that's where process capability indices start coming into play. If I think about processes and having an expected outcome, we usually know that there's going to be variation associated with it. And that's where the idea of the bell-shaped curve comes in. So my process is going to have an expected outcome someplace in the center here, which we usually refer to as mu, or sometimes it's refer to, referred to as a target value. And then I'm going to have variation coming out from it. And that size of that variation is also often referred to as the standard deviation, or sigma. And that's that one right here. So as I go one standard deviation, two standard deviation, three standard deviations out, I kind of cover how my bell-shaped curve starts falling off. I expect to produce the more here at the average, and as I move away from the average, I expect to have less of them occurring. Likewise, to the negative side, so at a minus one, minus two, minus three, and that whole width of that outcome is usually six standard deviations. So now if I start talking about what the voice of the customer is looking for, that's where I bring in the idea of a specification. And I usually have a lower specification and a higher specification. And the voice of my customer is saying, I want everything to fit in between here. If I think of the voice of the process, my process varies. I have some place that I want to hit in the middle. I produce or make less of them as I farther go away. And that's where we get our bell-shaped curve. Now, if I bring both of those together, I would ideally like to say that when I think of the voice of the customer and the process together, I'm going to start describing things that I am capable of meeting things. So in this particular diagram, I have a situation that I really like and approve of, that I'm fitting well in between things, and I have room over here. <clears throat> if I was to have a situation like this where I'm still okay, but I'm shifted over a little bit, geez, I don't have a lot of room over here, and I'm still doing okay, though. But here, right here, I am making rejects now. That my process is not where it should be. It's not centered, and I have things falling outside of what the voice of my customer would like. So I want to be between the garage walls. I want to fit between the goal posts and not hit the garage wall. Process performance now talks about the idea of what happens with drifts. So I could be producing something here this time, but as time moves on, as I move my time on, well, it seems that things have shifted a little bit. So I think I've shifted a little bit that way on this one. Oh, I really shifted this way on this one. This one here shifts back that way. This one shifts this way again. So if I keep these little shifts going on, things are drifting in my, in my process, and that's where the performance comes in, is saying that I am thinking about what is the performance over time. Capability considers all of these individual curves one at a time, but performance considers all of the curves together. So if I was to go and look at it from the end view here, I would say, well, I'm producing here this time. I'm producing there the next time. There, then there, then there. And process performance says, well, what does the whole thing look like from this end point of view? So let's get to the indices. This is where the analytical point of view starts coming in. So I was trying to give you some graphical thoughts there, and I'm trying to think of some things from an analytical point of view. And we get formulas that help us start thinking about things. So here is what my process is producing. Here's what my customer wants. Here are the specifications. And here's the width of my variation that I see when I produce things. And so over here, we have all these formulas that I'm going to go into detail about right now. 
process capability. I'm going to start with, first of all, what's called CP. CP is discussing the difference of my spec width compared to my process width. So I get a number like that. And this process width estimate comes from this, this sigma r. And sigma r comes from control chart type of information saying I'm going to take the r bar, which is the average range, and divide it by e2, which is a constant based on the sample size of things here. With that being known, um, <clears throat> the next thing is, is to talk about CPK, where we're going to say the numerator and the denominator are the same thoughts, but each of these now are considering something a little bit different. Here we're considering the distance from the average to the specification limit, and here we're and both of those numerators are talking about, and then we're considering it to half the distribution width. And again, when we calculate out both of those, we want to take the minimum of them. And we're using, again, the same type of estimator in the denominator of sigma r, which is based off of the average again, and this constant based on the sample size. So that kind of describes the analytical thinking of what is going on here. So a CP value does not have any concerns about centering of the data. So I could be perfectly centered and have the same CP value as if I was over and I was producing rejects off to the side. A CB, CP value of 1 means the numerator is roughly the same as the denominator. So the numerator was the distance between the specifications here. And then the denominator was the width of my spec. So both of those things are roughly the same size. But again, it could be that it's way off-centered. A CP value of 1 means that the process, the numerator is so big, but the process width is smaller. So I can have a very nice process width here. But again, as it doesn't account for centering things, I could still be having problems over here. A CP value less than 1 means that my denominator, the process width, is bigger than my numerator, which is a spec width. So the process distribution is, is covering the whole thing and even more. So we will be producing rejects in that particular case. So now if I want to adjust for location, that's where the CPK comes in. So CPK is going to sit down and say, I'm going to take and consider where this average is, and I'm going to have in my numerator this distance or this distance. And then my denominator is this distance here. So being that the case, I'm going to get rid of my marks here real quick. Being that the case, I'm going to say my, so here I have a small numerator because that's the distance between the averages and then my denominator is going to be something big like that. Performance capability with PP and PPK, those things that I just discussed about CP and CPK are the same. The only real difference here is the estimator of sigma. That standard deviation or the, the element that we're using to get an estimate to how wide our distribution is encompasses the entire data set and is what you would get out of using a calculator uh, and saying what is the standard deviation of all of these numbers together without considering anything about sub you know control chart subgrouping thoughts or anything like that. These equations again are identical to what you saw before it's just is that that estimator right there for the standard deviation is changed. What do you see when you look at the values that you can get out of calculating some of these things? As I described earlier, well let me back up, sorry, that was that was not the right thing of what I should have been doing. Sorry. CP is what we've described. The Z value here 
is about how do I transform the, the process stuff thinking that I've been looking at and then saying, well, I want it all kind of standardized. So there's this thing called the standard normal distribution, which has a average target value of zero, and the standard deviation is considered as one. So when you think of a, a bell-shaped curve all the time, here I am at zero. I have a standard deviation of one. Well, I said that there were six of those, so uh, there is three off of this side, three standard deviations, and three standard deviations off of this side. If you go back to what I was considering in this diagram here, if you recall, that um, I got to get back to the right slide here. Now I'm just, I apologize. Um, <clears throat> that again we have this six standard deviations across all of this thing in a standard normal distribution. Well if I look at the three on each side I'm producing parts per millions of 2,700 parts per million out of spec. So the PPM here is parts per million. If I look at what a standard normal distribution is I should have 2,000 700 parts per million being thrown out, but my CP value of 1 says that everything is fitting right in between my lower spec limit and my upper, upper spec limit. So everything's fitting there with that CP value of 1. If I go to this magical number of 1.33 that sometimes is referred to as a spot where a person wants to be, well this Z value says that, well, the distance to my spec upper spec of upper and lower spec is really I have one more standard deviation out here so now I have four standard deviations is where my lower spec limit is as we'll say so I have like the standard deviation of room on each side of my process and I have a little bit of room here to let my process float a little bit and with doing that I've really reduced my parts per million possibility of defects to go down so let me note one more time here is that the CP informs if the process will fit between the specs but it doesn't mean a lot practically. CPK being greater than 1.33 the process is centered enough with a little room on each side of it. If the CPK is between 1 and 1.3 the process is just making it is usually not acceptable and if it is less than one, the process is very close to the specification and will be and there will be rejects. When it comes to calculating and understanding some of those numbers, here are some of this, the things that we need to be thinking about. The process needs to be stable. How do we tell if the process is stable? Well, we usually have to be considering a con control chart. The distribution, the distribution, boy, that was really a rented. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll try to do better here. I'm sorry. The distribution needs to be um, a good fit for when you're calculating things. The indice uses an estimator to calculate in the calculations um, based on the underlying distribution. If the distribution doesn't fit what those estimators are supposed to be, then we're going to run into then it's going to run into troubles. <clears throat> so the data should be normally dis distributed, the bell-shaped curve. I am saying that, that there are ways to handle things if it is not normal, but I think it's outside of this talk. Software packages such as Minitab can deal with those things. Um, and I think with it regards to the, with regards to the, um, CQE exam, uh, I think you're only going to need to be worrying about that the data is, there's really isn't going to be much that's going to be establishing about these things. These are kind of some practical statements that you should be thinking about. Um, so things about the data is the data is going to be gathered in subgroup sampling. So you have subgroup sizes of two, three, four, and five. Um, I'll touch a little bit later on saying if we are only taking samples of one, the data is gathered using rational subgrouping and this is one of those things that I think is important that people need to understand well even when it comes to control charts in general 
rational subgroup grouping really means that within the sampling that I'm taking of this subgroup of two or three or four or five statements here, you know, when I'm doing things here, is that there is very little change while I'm taking that little subgroup of two or three or five. But when I go to get my next subgroup, that there is an opportunity for change. So within, I want it to be very, very chance of a very small chance of change. Between them, I want a larger chance of change. And lastly, that the data is all kept in chronological order. So CPK is often referred to as the win within, and PPK often talks about overall. So when we calculate so I'm trying to describe here is what is the differences between these two, between CPK and PPK. CPK looks at the within subgroup variation. So as I go from one subgroup to the next subgroup to the next subgroup, I have a certain amount of variation within each of those subgroups. It really ignores the differences from that subgroup to the next subgroup often is referred to as a potential capability, meaning that if I ignore the differences from one subgroup to another subgroup, the best I probably can get to is what I see within averaging all of these subgroups. PPK, on the other hand, accounts for all of the variation, both within and between, and this really is what the customer will be experiencing, and to me, from my background, and practically speaking, the PPK is the one that is the most important to understand and to be looking at when calculations are made. So what does performance mean? Well, here's a graph from Minitab, and that if you look at the performance, uh, this is, you know, I have a subgroup here, subgroup here, subgroup here. I have a certain amount of variation, a certain amount of variation. And I'm having shifts in each of those subgroups as I get them. So notice here that this one, this one point right up here is about 432. This one point way down here is I'm going to roughly say is 378, which gives me a range of 54. So over here, I'm kind of thinking that this is roughly speaking 54. If I was to remove the mean of each of those subgroups, subtract out the mean for this subgroup, subtract out the mean for this subgroup, so hence, that's why I get a straight line here and I removed the between subgroup variations. Well, this point up here, roughly speaking, is 25. This point down here, roughly speaking, is a minus 22, which now gives me a range of about 47. So I, by removing that between stuff, I reduced the range that I see in that amount of uh, data. So that is where performance comes in, in saying, well, this really is about this, I'm sorry, this should be what performance means. I'm sorry, I got it right. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I understand. This is really what the capability means, and on my page up, that is what performance means. I'm sorry for messing myself up there. So now if we look at some more information coming from Minitab, uh, and this is using that same data, and Minitab spit out the output here. Uh, what I want to do is just to blow this up for a moment. And to take a look at those CPs and PPs and take a look at those values and you sit down and say, well, as you can see that, again, when we talked about the the numbers themselves, the bigger the number when it comes to these indices, the better we think our process is performing. So in the potential or in the bottom part of the screen here, we got a CP is 0.63, but the PP, CPK is 
Now if I think of the overall, the top one with the PP, I have a 0.54 and a PPK of 0.48. So my overall capability, which is what my customer will see, is worse than what my potential capability is. And so, you know, that's kind of what we're trying to get at here is, is what do we think we see here? What, what kind of numbers are those comparing? You can easily say by the graphical aspect of this that the um, data, I really don't even really have to think too much about these, whoops. I really don't have to think too much about what these things are saying because I can easily see right here of what kind of things are going on here. So here's the analytical side of things, here's the graphical side of things, and my PGA little metaphor. <clears throat> so when it comes to looking at those numbers and deciding what you need to do, well what kind of actions can you take? You can either take and do nothing, I can either change the specifications, and sometimes that's really the, you know, that's kind of easy to do sometimes. It may, might not be what your customer wants, so then it isn't easy to do. But depending on situations that I've seen before, that specifications are almost, are sometimes plucked out of the air, and maybe it's easy enough just to change the specification. But another thing to do is that you can center the process. I might also have to reduce the variability, or similar to doing nothing is you just got to accept the losses. Whoops, bad spelling once again. Sorry about that. So let's move on to practically. Um, practically speaking, the indices summarizes things into one number. It's very easy to look at one number. It's very easy to sit down and say, well, I like the idea that numbers should be less than 1.33. Well, that's nice, but again, I want to point out that when in, pra in a practical aspect, CP is basically useless. All it can tell you is that it's a nice idea. Things can fit between my specifications, and you know that's the way it is. But in a practical sense, it doesn't move you forward that much. Next thing I want to talk about practically is differences between CP and CPK. The, so my point here is saying the larger the difference, the more probable that things are giving you control issues. The larger the difference, the more likely the process has some type of a control problem. It, PP is going to pick up all of those between differences and add them in there, and the larger that difference gets, the more that aspect is, uh, is there, the, the more that factor is relevant. Um, PPK is what the customer will experience. That's why I kind of say that's the number you need to, to be worried about. With respect to a subgroup size of one, um, I am no CQE um, exam writer. Out of the ones that I've looked at, I've never seen the question come up about saying what happens with a subgroup size of one. So I don't think it's going to be on the, gra on the exam. Subgroup size or ones are handled by moving average type thoughts and they're handled very well in um, handled very well in software packages. So I would like to say uh, that's all I have right now. So I'm ready to move into questions that you may have. And uh, this is my contact information if you have any questions on what I said or presented here. So Adam, I'm ready to have you help me a little bit with understanding where questions were coming from. Okay. Would you would you like me to to go through them to read them, Scott? Would Would you help me with that, sir? Absolutely. Uh, so I'll start with uh, with obviously the first one. Uh, this one appears to be in a few parts, so perhaps we'll we'll break it up. Uh, <clears throat> PPK is a measure of process performance which do not require which do not require and stable process. So its use is not recommended on the industry to take decisions about a process. However, it is known that some companies are still using this measure 
And then when I come with the following, what is the validity of, of this measure's conclusions? What are the issues to use this instead of CPK? Um, so let's perhaps the validity part is one question, and we'll we'll break it up into parts, Scott. Yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll I would like to address the first part here on saying that um, the the idea of that I just ended with and saying that PPK is taking in between these subgroup variations. So I mentioned that these values are calculated off of some type of a control chart thinking with regards to saying I have an R bar and I need this D2, so this stuff is being gathered up in samples. So I should be able to take a look at a control chart and decide if that control chart is in control or not in control in this first place. So that's basically the way I've been examining this idea about PPK and that it is really dependent on saying what is the validity of, of, of a process being in control and then how much are these little variations between subgroups still within control within acceptable statistical amount and then where does that roll into the calculation of PPK uh, so basically I'm trying to say is that a control chart should tell you if the process is in control PPK gives you an idea of what the customer will experience CPK is your best possible idea of what you could experience if I could eliminate all that in between stuff So the next part of the yeah. question is what are the issues to use this instead of CPK? Perhaps you answered that one already in your last response? I do. I, I think I did. I think I did okay. answer it in saying that PPK, if the control chart is in control, PPK is what your customer is going to be experiencing and that's the one you should be thinking about. The next part is if a process validation is based on PPK, what are we really concluding about the process? Well, let me let me let me talk about this from a different perspective quick before I get into just focusing in on PPK. Process validation should never come down to one number is is what I'm going to sit down and say. Um that there are several things that you should be looking at besides just one indice and that's the one of these things that my I personally kinda have seen so many times where debate is brought up over and over again about saying well I don't have 1.33 what are we going to do about it and there's other things that need to be considered you know the cost I gave those different things about you can do nothing you can accept the losses what are the costs associated with regards to reducing the variation, all those things. So those are other factors that have to go into the, the decision about saying whether or not the process is validated or not. Um, <clears throat> so if I get back to thinking about this question and saying, am I only going to use PPK? Well, you know what, I, I, it just comes down to saying, well, if you're only going to use PPK, you're going to have a lot of arguments going on. I know I kind of stepped aside from that as a real direct answer but I think you have to you have to decide on the reality of the process that you're doing you have to consider the cost and time of things going on and if you're dealing with somebody that says it must be 1.33 then you're going to have to have a discussion about saying well it's going to cost me this much to either reduce my variation to get it down it has to cost this much in order for me to ship the process this much in order to get it to do that, uh, that that's where those conversations have to go Okay, uh, let's see. Is there any way to move from PPK slash CPK to an AQL? Um, yeah, you can you can sit down and, and move those things, but I think that, uh, and you can map those things. I just have to, I got to say, I didn't think about that direction about what it can do but an acceptable quality level I mean if you think about an, an AQL of an acceptable quality level there's the higher my CPK number is it means the tighter my distribution is the better it fits within the the uh, specifications 
So my acceptable quality level should be correspondingly being th thought about from that perspective. Do you have anything to add on that, Adam? I, I do not. As you said, I, I have not thought about that uh, okay. either, moving from one to the other. Um, let's see. It sounds like the next part of the question is there. So um, I know that for one-sided spec, it is possible to pass from, and I'm not sure I know this acronym, but I'll say it, LNTL to a PPK approach using K equal 3 PPK. Is there any way to do this with a two-sided spec? I am going to have to pass on that particular question because I don't okay. quite follow it. Okay. I hate to say that. It doesn't make me sound like much of an expert, but <laughs> I, um, I guess I'm not sure where that one's I, going. I yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll move on. It's okay. Uh, the next question is about transformations. If we analyze a non-normal distribution and perform process capability, is it possible to link this with a confidence and reliability level? How are PPK, CPK related to confidence and reliability levels if the data needs to be transformed? Um, so when you transform the data, what, you're, what is it that you're trying to do? You're trying to make it look normal, right? So you're, you're you're trying to make it look normal and then work it into those situations. But in software packages such as Minitab, they will work off of the base distribution of what it would of what it should be and get to that transformation and then calculate those corresponding percentages and, and indices based off of that distribution. So that calculation is also transformed into that new transform distribution. Did I said that really poorly. I'm sorry about that, but I think the point gets across is saying that as the transformation occurs, the indices transformations are, are also associated with the calculation to generally give you that indice at the end of the day as it relates to that particular distribution. So I think, let me see if I can repeat that, Scott, and see if, if you agree with me. If you transform appropriately, then confidence levels are maintained. Correct? Is that is that what you're saying? Cor correct. That the, the the when it when you talk about PPK and CPKs, I don't think directly of confidence intervals. I think of that indice being being able to say how well and how centered am I, and those indices given the same 1.33 in some type of skewed space is telling me that, okay, I got 1.33, which should indicate I should have some space on either side of the distribution. Even though it's at a skewed distribution, I had to fix it somehow with, with using a chi-squared distribution, and I go through and fix those things, and, and it comes out. Okay, thank you. The next one is also on uh, transformations. Um, if data needs to be transformed, but it is not possible to transform the spec limit, is our capability performance analysis reliable? I guess I'm having a hard time picturing how the spec limits could not be transformed, but the data could be. Um, I don't get how that could occur. That the, if it might it be that you don't know how to transform it into those spaces, but given, given if you have, I, so like this is again probably outside of the space of talking about what would happen in the CQE exam. So I didn't spend a lot of time digesting thoughts into where that would go. But um, software packages will handle all of that for you or should handle that transformation stuff and saying, if I have a specification here, a specification here, I need to transform it 
by this type of a function, it should take all of that and transform it all over for you in that software package. The one that I use is does that. The next question, on the slide with CP, Z value, and PPM, aren't the PPM numbers only true if and only if the process average is centered? Yes, yes, that person is absolutely correct. That person is absolutely correct about that. And I probably should have been a little clearer in how I described that. Um, those PPMs, yeah, if you move the distribution way over from a CPK perspective, um, you could have a CPK of 1.33, but it's not going to give you the same PPM values if it's shifted way over. That's a good point. Excellent point by Matt. The, the next question, what about the fact that PPM calculated for a CPK or PPK using Z tables are incorrect? Oh, okay, so this was similar to the previous question. Yep. All right. Um, what about, uh, so similar question, what about the fact that CPK values are inaccurate if the data is not normally distributed? Yeah, so that can not just non-centered but skewed in some way, I'm assuming. Yeah, that could be true too. That could be true too. Okay. Uh, the next question is about providing the slide deck. Um, I will talk to Scott uh, online after the fact about the, that question. So next question is about calculating confidence limits. What about the fact that a CPK is only a sample statistic and that to know something about the population parameter, we have to calculate confidence limits on the CPK? Okay, I'm digesting that question here a little bit. Okay, so my quick answer here again is that I didn't spend a lot of time getting myself ready thinking about some of these things uh, that this was about what was going to be on the CQE. You're not going to be asked about confident limits on a CPK during the CQE. Um, confidence limits on the CPK are uh, just are things that I have dealt with in the past and in general, developing a confidence limit for the CPK is a is a difficult thing to do with regards to how much those errors with regards to the standard deviation. You're going to have two things in there. You're going to have the, the a confidence limit associated with the mean, and you're going to have a confidence limit associated with the standard deviation. And then those two things mathematically propagate into the formula. So both of those then add into developing the confidence limit for the CPK and it's kind of outside of the t things that we're talking about here. It's a good discussion because I, the times that I've spent investigating confidence limit on CPKs, people would be rather appalled by the answer that you get on that. Usually they're not as informative as people would have hoped them to be. You're saying if I have 1.33, the confidence limit on that 1.33 often goes from like down to 1 and up to 1.75. I mean it's a big confidence interval compared to that 1.33 saying that's my magic number. Okay, thank you. Uh, so here's a, a question on uh, wording. So <clears throat> to say CP informs if the process will fit between specs uh, is misleading. I th think you mean CP informs if the process can fit between specs. Can you, can you comment on the difference between those, Scott? Yeah. Um, the, words, the word difference between there is when I used will versus can. And absolutely correct. The wording would have been better. It, it can fit. It can fit. What does that mean? I can fit it and it means I have to shift the process 
in order to get it to fit. I have to change the process average somehow in order to get it to fit in there. So what does it take to do that? Well, I'm not sure I, I can do that, but if I could do it, then it will fit. Okay. Uh, here's another question on non-normal data. What if the process is not normal? I work in the seafood industry, however, harvesting is not a stable process. Can I still use PPK? <clears throat> Um, if it's not a stable process, I would be, uh, I would say no, you don't want to be calculating PPK because um, you need some type of stability in order for those indices to mean something. If it's not stable, those confidence, the confidence you have in that generation of that indice is, is degraded. So I would not be using PPK in that industry. If you, if, if you say it's not stable, you know it's not stable. I can't, the control chart would tell me it's not stable. Um, I wouldn't do that. I would try to figure out some other means of some type of uh, measurement for what I need to decide about uh, and try to figure out if I can get stability about that measurement on whatever question I have. All right, thank you. The, the next question is about trends in subgroups. What is the best way to respond to or handle trends in subgroup populations smaller than 20 or 25 when looking at data from uh, control charts? Uh, let's see. So the, the question continues just a little bit. We have a process we run five to eight times a year and want to know how to best handle fluctuations that may be three sigma but are within spec? Um, so, okay, so if I look at this particular situation right here, I would, I would then take it from a practical point of view in my argument on saying um, if I'm going to be a purist about saying things need to can be in control and I am going to sit down and make these indices, um, I will give you the indice, but I can't, I can't have confidence in what that, that that is the true number of the indices. I would then say, practically speaking, I have a lot of the process is not in control, so I would then say, but look at where my specifications are with re, with respect to all of my data. Um, is that is that a good visual picture that I can live with? And if I calculate out the indice and I have a good picture, that indice is like two or three or four. I can live with a high, super high indice like that, with it's in the two or the three range, and say there's probably a big confidence interval with that and then if I show you the graph compared to my specifications with that data that graph would look good and I would make my argument from a practical point of view from that direction. Okay. A, the next question is on uh, non-normal data. So for non-normal data such as data from skewed manufacturing processes at a few specified values what is the typical way to evaluate the capability? I'm 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 digesting here. Would you like to, to read again, Scott? No, I'm kind of I'm 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 trying to get. Well, maybe you can help me understand the question here a little bit. And saying the process at a few spe specified values, the skewed manufacturing process at a few specified values. So the skewing is really taking off just over at a certain area, is what I'm kind of inferring from that. Is that how you read that one, Adam? Um.
I guess I skipped over that and, and just kind of imagined the question being what's the when you have data that uh, come from a skewed distribution, what is the best way to measure capability? That's how I interpret the question. Okay, that question there, um, the skewed data is where I'm going to have to use some type of software package that's going to help me transform that data uh, and say that it that I can at least test what test how good the transformation worked, saying whether or not the the transformation for what produced very little residual you know errors in, in looking at in a residual analysis of those differences between what I predicted the value to be versus what the observed value should be underneath that transformation. If that is a good type of normal plot and the software package then says here are your indices, I would say here's my best estimate of what those are. But if the the normal plot on those residuals was bad and I still had those indices, I would say the, those indices are probably invalid then. And I, I, I don't have the means of giving you an answer that, here's an answer, but it's, it's probably not a very accurate answer. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> the next is a, a question on interpreting PPK and CPK. In other words, uh, PP is the current state of the process, and CPK is what to be expected. Is that? Uh, can you comment on the, those interpretations? Um, I'm going to go back to the way I said it before, and I don't know if this is helping the situation or not. PP and PPK is what the customer is going to see. That is accounting for everything that occurs with these little drifts here and there as the data was being taken. It takes the whole data set and gives me the estimate of standard deviation, gives me the estimate of the mean, and I calculate out that indice based off of that. CPK is going to block these little differences from one subgroup to the other subgroup to the other subgroup. And I'm going to get a number that's smaller than the PP or PPK, and better, I should say better, not smaller, better, which is going to be bigger. And if I could remove all of that little bit of variation going on between subgroups, then CPK is going to be the answer that I should get with PPK if I could remove all that. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is about uh, considering the data to be from a time series. Uh, for CP, CPK, if the data uh, is not time series, are CP and CPK indices valid? Those numbers are valid. Yes, those numbers are. It says collected on a control chart is what I heard there. So those and the control chart is in control. CP and CPK indices will be valid, but it is, again, not what your customer is going to see. You can sit down and say that, again, I'll, I'll bring up the point of view of saying that if there is a big difference between PPK and CPK. One is, you know, one is much different than the other. I would, uh, the probability that that control chart is in control has to decrease immensely. I mean, it's, it's more probable that control chart will not be in control if there is a big difference between PPK and CPK. I think I said that right. The, if there's a big difference between PPK in CPK, the probability is very small that that control chart will be in control. Okay. The next question is on sample sizes. For a given number of samples, say 30 samples, what's the difference between using 30 samples at subgroup size of 1 and using 10 subgroups at subgroup size of 3 for process stability and capability analysis. If the process is unstable at subgroup size 3 but not 
if the if is unstable at subgroup size three, but not stable at subgroup size one, do we consider it stable process or an unstable process? So I. I I guess I again see two parts to the question. The first is what's the difference between so same sample size but taking more subgroups with less samples per subgroup, and then is there um, it, it could the, could the situation occur where if you have higher subgroup sizes you have an in control process, but at lower subgroup sizes you have a, a, a your your process is not in control. So this is a really good question with. And I could spend a lot of time dissecting the permutations that I kind of see within this. But what I'll start with saying is a subgroup size of one, um, <clears throat> again, that on the CQE exam, I don't think you're going to, I, have, I haven't read every question that every CQE exam has had about process capability, but I have not seen one that deals with a subgroup size of one. With that being said, I hadn't thought much down this avenue, but what I can say is that a subgroup size of one is going to be looking at what are the differences from one value to the next value. So I have to, I'm, I'm calculating my, my variation, my standard deviation on the differences I'm seeing as I move from one group, from one point to the next point, from one point to the next point, from one point to the next point. And I'm going to gather all those differences up and make an estimate of my variation. In a subgroup size of three, I'm going to be looking at the range value in my first subgroup, the range value in my second subgroup, the range value in my third subgroup, the range value in my fourth subgroup, and make an estimate of my variation that way. So each one of those are giving me two different methodologies on how I'm going to get the size of that variation. That difference right there could be enough to say, well, one time I look at it, it's stable, and the other time it isn't stable. Um, so that's the best I can give off of a quick answer like that without really writing some stuff out and, and, and going into a deep thinking process of it. The subgroup size of three is going to be using the central limit theorem with the calculating an average. I'm using a different method of establishing my variation size. So I can see differences occurring that way, but it's still occurring out of the same, pro out of the same uh, da data, let's say. I would believe, though, my analysis better with the subgroup size of three than I am going to sit down and say with the subgroup size of one, just because of the central limit theorem on how whatever the distribution is, the more I average this information as I get it, the more the, the distribution is going to look like a normal distribution. Thank you, Scott. So we're going to continue, Scott, as long as it's all right with you, I'm going to continue with questions, uh, the few more questions. I have uh, times received on them, so I'm going to try to get to the questions that came in before 1 o'clock. Um, uh, so just an idea. We'll try to move through them uh, quickly. So uh, the next question is about large capability indexes. So capability indexes above two generally mean I can pay attention to other characteristics. Do you agree? Um. I would say that the answer there is saying if I have a if I have a cap an indice greater than two, I'm not going to worry about that one very much at all. I would focus in on something else, and I would agree with that statement. If I if I'm understanding it correctly again, Adam, and saying that I would think there's other parameters, they're bigger fish to fry than me worrying about that one. Is that the, am I answering that question? It seems so to me. Uh, the next question is about, uh, well, I'll just read it. Montgomery says that PPK is not recommended and it is not required to have a stable process. How is that? Well, I know Montgomery gets bigger paychecks than I do. 
Um, and how is how is he saying that that to have a stable process? I'm see the, I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding what the question is there because it seems like I'm I'm going to say, well, I have a it's look like I'm looking at the PPK value to say I have a stable process and and I would not use the PPK value to say I have a stable process. So I'd, I'd have to separate that a little bit. The stability of the process and that indice are two things that are just not related to each other. I mean, I can make that indice occur. It just isn't the number I'm going to use to say that the process is stable. Okay. All right. So it would be a control chart to look at stability as opposed to PPK then, correct? Correct. Correct. I would not make any as any evaluation on stability based off of these indices because the process I can still calculate these indices without a stable process in place it's just is that the indice is invalid then. The next question is about removing out of control data points. So from your perspective is it correct to remove uh, examined identified special cases of out of control data before calculating PPK to evaluate a last year's process? <clears throat> if you can sit down and say there is a special cause, I would feel comfortable with saying I can remove though that those numbers influencing the calculation of those indices. But you have to be assured that you are truly removing that special cause, you know, that there is a, that you can assign a special cause to it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question is again on uh, non-normal data is about moving away from continuous data to discrete data. So how would you determine capability from data that are distributed binomially? Well, um, the I would leave that up to the software package then to make that calculation for me once again, saying that the binomial distribution uh, is able to create a software package could take the binomial distribution and figure out how to manage coming up with those numbers uh, on its own, the, no matter where the binomial distribution is. I do know that as the binomial distribution gets um, <clears throat> further and further away from a zero point that it's going to be more associated with being a normal distribution and you're going to be all right from that aspect but you need to be you need to be in a certain location of the binomial distribution away from zero to be able to do that. All right, thank you. Yes, I definitely agree that there are circumstances under which the binomial distribution may be approximated very well by the normal distribution. Uh, the, the next question is about uh, AIAG. So the question is the AIAG recommends using the process capability indices CP and CPK when the process is in control and the process standard deviation estimated by and I don't I don't see a, what it's estimated by but when the process is not in control the AIAG recommends using process performance indices PP and PPK um, and I don't see the rest of, rest of the questions oh no that just when the process is not in control that's what the AIAG recommends. Well, can you, can you comment on, on those statements? Um, I guess if I heard that correctly, Adam, and saying that if the process is in control, uh, AIAG is, is saying, well, you could use CP and CPK. But if it's not in control, use PP and PPK. Is that That's the, general... the way I interpret the question as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess you know I'm going to sit down and say, yeah, I can I can use if the process is in control, I can use those numbers. But once again, 
my customer or what is going to be seen downstream doesn't really give a rat's behind about that. Um, is what I would say. Yeah, I can use those numbers, sure, but I would sit down, like I just said, the what is observed down the line is more going to be related with the PP and PPK. All right, thank you. Uh, I think this, so, so I think that'll be our last question. There was a clarification on a previous question about the, the the, um, the points in the distribution. So I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll read that, and and then we will uh, we will we'll end the webinar. So the the clarification is when the manufacturers skew the process, sometimes the manufacturers fix the value. We'll get a charter of data at some fixed values. So this was the comment about a few fixed values in the skewed distribution instead of a normal distribution. So it sounds like they're getting more. Dis the 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 idea was that instead of a nice bell-shaped continuous distribution, you're getting a, just a few values, a few distinct values. I think that's how I'm interpreting that. All right, um, so excellent presentation and question and answer session. Scott, thank you very much. Uh, we ask our attendees to complete the short survey at this time available within GoToWebinar. A recording of the webinar will be available within a few days on the division's YouTube channel at youtube.com slash, slash ASQ Stats Division. Please be sure to share this webinar and our other archived webinars with friends, coworkers, and colleagues. Also, we encourage you to check out the division's LinkedIn page and our events calendar. Please visit asq.org statistics for the latest news on webinars, conferences, and many other topics. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks everyone for joining us, and thank you again, Scott, for presenting with the statistics division. I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. My pleasure.